Those who are here in person um, are enjoying a delicious meal. So if you're able, you know, um, in future, for future years, we, we, uh, we always welcome people to be here as well. Um, and a special thanks to Purple Onion and Steve Angelo for providing the food. Um, <laughs> So, um, state of the school, uh, we have two parts to today's presentation. Um, I will talk for 25 minutes or so about kind of the schools, um, you know, some of the key initiatives that are happening this year. This year we want to talk a little bit about um, how we use data as a school and, and share a little bit out more on um, building on some of the parent presentations that we've done earlier this year. Um, and then the second half will be uh, CFO Margaret Rondazzo and Vl Vlado Herman, a member of our board, who will talk a little bit about the financial model and, and um, provide lots of detail about the school's finances and, and answer any and all questions in that area. Um, we always like to start, well first of all, I, I loved this picture. Um, it kind of captures all the emotions of flag, um, <laughs> the excitement of the potential of telling a joke, um, you know, the sense that I'm just not going to get called on today. Um, but eventually, eventually I'll get up there. Um, so ho hopefully none of you will end up feeling like that at the end of this. You'll, you'll retain the excitement um, that happens every time I say, would you like to tell a joke? Um, and if anybody at the end of this would like to tell a joke, you're welcome to do that. So we always start, um, or I always try, like to start this presentation with vision and mission. And, and as a school, uh, and as an independent school, we are deeply guided by our vision. Um, this drives all of the decisions we make. And so, you know, to inspire students to achieve their dreams and reach beyond themselves to make a difference in the world, um, that's something we've, that's drawn people to this school. It's what drew me to this school. Um, and, and it is something that guides us. And so, as I like to say when we talk about the vision, there's really two parts to that. The first part, um, inspiring students to achieve their dreams, is providing them the knowledge, skills, and confidence, which is language out of our mission, um, to be able to do that, to be able to do anything that they set their mind to. And then the second part of that vision is reaching beyond make a difference in the world. Um, and as I'll talk about in a moment, um, that's something that's been core since our beginning. And um, when, if you go back the last four years and you look back at Vision 2020, that was something that as a school we said, boy, we don't know that we're doing enough of that. And so I think as, as you hear, as we talk a little bit today, you'll hear lots of evidence of how reaching beyond to make a difference in the world has become like, totally core to what we do as a school each and every day. The other thing um, that I want to mention, uh, you know, core values, be kind, be curious, take risks, be your best. You know, that's what you know, children know um, and, and they, they live those every day on campus. The other thing this year that we were really intentional about reintroducing were communication norms. And so these communication norms, we've had communication norms, as I've shared kind of at various events during the fall, for a number of years. Um, but one of the, there was a sense um, towards the end of last year and as we were heading into this year that the previous communication norms, they weren't well known um, and they, they weren't used as actively as we wanted them to be used. And so we kind of recommitted to, to the communication norms. And so we have, and we also um, rewrote them um, to simplify them. And so um, you've heard that if you've been at any event this fall, you've heard us talk about these, but you know, assume goodwill, come from your own experience, be more curious than certain, and hold yourself and others capable. So we started in the summer with employees um, talking about those communication norms. We actually did role playing around like different situations. What would that look like in different situations? And then um, any of you attended the, the opening coffees for the year, we spent a little bit of time talking about them there. Ultimately, the, the success of these communication norms is whether or not we actually live them. Um, and so, you know, as a, I will certainly speak for myself, I have been very conscious of them this year in a way that I don't think I had even been over the last few years. And I, and I find myself in meetings, like circling back to them and thinking about them. And I know, um, you know, as I've talked with other uh, members of our community, that they're there, they're palpable, and I think they make a huge difference. And so, you know, I, I, starting today, what we're as a school doing is we're trying to build a culture. And I think committing to these communication norms is a big part of ensuring that that's a healthy culture. And so, you know, as I've been saying all year, I invite you, um, you know, certainly as employees, like, you know, we are actively trying to live this every day. As families, we invite you to join in that, you know, and, and we encourage you to, um, you know, to engage with these, to ask us question about, questions about these, um, and then and to really push us and you to like live these, because we think it makes a difference. It doesn't get rid of conflict. Um, we know there'll be conflict. We know, you know, we're dealing with humans. 
And then we're dealing with lots of small humans. Um, and, and so there's lots of emotions involved right, when you're dealing with children. And so we're not gonna get rid of that conflict. We do think that these four communication norms help in, 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 in enabling us to successfully partner with you and to successfully partner with each other. So Vision 2020, uh, we introduced this four years ago. And um, today I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this, but we've accomplished a lot. Um, and and that's, a, that's a big we. <laughs> that's um, you know, teachers, staff, administrators, board members, families, like uh, this whole community has come together to accomplish a lot in the last four years. And so I wanna go through and celebrate um, because as you know, we're, it's November of 2019, um, you know, we are heading towards the end of Vision 2020 and fortunately we can look back at this and say, hey, we've done a pretty good job. So um, number, the first, you know, there are four main plans. So up here you have a whole assortment of photographs sharing different types of Reach Beyond activities. And so over the last few years, we've created Reach Beyond Week initially, um, which was, a, you know, was for middle schoolers, a week-long experience, which led into Reach Beyond Block, which now, as hopefully everybody knows, Every child, JK through eighth grade, has a you know, block on either Tuesday or Thursday afternoon where they are doing something connected to reaching beyond. We've launched the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship, um, you know, and we have a new director, uh, you know, Annie Mackle, who's not new anymore, but um, you know, who, you know, who's now been here for several years guiding the work of the Scott Center. And it's led to some really exciting opportunities to figure out how do we reach beyond and just as importantly, how do we make that a, like just a daily part of the way that children think as they're going through our healthy experience, and a way as a community that we think about the importance of education. And so just a quick example, um, in, the, in that lower corner, that was, that's a, one of our more recent Reach Beyond Block experiences. Fourth graders um, have been doing kind of a variation on a problem investigators unit where they are you know, trying to find out and, and understand issues on campus. And so as a group, they, they were broken into smaller teams and this particular team became interested in the issue of recycling, composting, trash, like how, are, how on campus were we managing that? And so what that picture is of is of a group of fourth graders going to meet with a group of first graders, they designed an activity, and they're teaching them about the five R's. Um, and I didn't know there were five R's, so I, so I actually learned. So the first one is refuse, which is kind of a fun one. Um, so, the, so, so, so the notion that you can like not take extra food, or you can refuse to take the plastic bottle. So the first one's refuse. And then the other ones, most of us probably know, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the last one is rot, um, which deals with composting. So, they, so the five R's. But again, it's just, it's a wonderful example of there's so many skills that are being taught in that moment for those fourth graders. Presentation skills, you know, understanding the, con, you know, the various concepts around sustainability. And then they're also engaging with younger children. So the first graders are also participating. So there's so much happening. And that is just like one snapshot, right, of, of the many types of things. The other thing I wanted to mention actually, and there's a, it's over here, we have the document. But I couldn't resist, I went back this morning, um, and we have a copy of the most recent Reach Beyond Block selection for middle school. And so this was from October through December. So this is like four pages front and back. There are 12 possibilities. Everything from youth court training, Senior Center Uplift, which was going to a senior center, uh, NaNoWriMo, which is a, um, they're participating in a national um, process of like creative writing. Um, there's WIFTI, which is Women in Finance and Technology Teaching Youth. The Happiness Hypothesis, a group of students trying to understand happiness and actually trying to figure out how that plays out in real, uh, so that, for example, that group yesterday was down visiting with kindergartners and there was students from the Happiness Hypothesis having conversations back and forth, the older students and the younger children talking about kindness and talking about happiness and what it meant to them. These are like uh, Hillbrook TV. So now if you walk, in, walk through the middle school, you'll see that there's a TV, which is every day a different student in the Hillbrook TV activity is putting up um, you know, news for the day. There's so many, these are real world applications of skills that they need. And, and again, not, and it's not just, it's important, it's reaching beyond, but it's not just reaching beyond. It's like all types of core academic skills that are happening during this time. So you know, when, when we look back many years from now um, and we think about you know, Vision 2020, I think you know, this, at the top of that list is going to be these types of reach beyond experiences and how they're transforming the educational experience on campus. 
The other thing that's happened um, over the last few years is that we've redesigned the schedule. And so, um, as I think every, you know, most people in this room probably know, over, you know, we are now in year two of a new schedule. So part of that new schedule is the Reach Beyond block. But the other piece of that new schedule, which probably gets less attention, um, at least I think in, like in the broader conversation, are the ways that we've rethought how we're co-teaching and collaborating together. So um, in the lower school, for example, we have significantly increased the number of um, people who are pushing in and working with lower school teams. And so, for example, um, you know, if you're in a second grade classroom and you're in a block of time where they're focused on math, there are multiple, in addition to the two lead teachers and the resident teacher, there are multiple other people who are moving in and out of that space, providing all types of support to help you know, students really challenge students and provide support either you know, you know, pulling kids up who are struggling or pushing kids who are excelling. And so, th so there's a whole host of people who are pushing in and because of the way we've redesigned the schedule are able to do that in a way that, wasn't, that we weren't able to do prior to just a few years ago. In the middle school, um, co-teaching has, has uh, we've always had a little bit of co-teaching, but with this new schedule, every middle school teacher is engaged in some type of collaboration. And so, for example, in the sixth grade, now we have you know, four lead sixth grade teachers. It's a sixth grade teaching team. You have a math, English, science, and history teacher. Those four people, in a, and there are several others who are also collaborating, but those are the four lead for the sixth grade team. They are designing that experience. And the way the schedule is created, there's lots of time where they are teaching together in a classroom. Um, the, the picture up here shows uh, two eighth grade teachers. So they the integrated studies history in eighth grade, you have a, a lead integrated studies history teacher and then the lead English teacher working together in a classroom. You cannot underestimate the importance of that collaboration. It's not always easy, by the way, right? You know, we talk about communication norms. One of the reasons as a school that we so focus on communication norms is we are so collaborative as a team. And it's much harder to collaborate. I mean, I, we, I always say, right, it'd be a lot easier to like go by yourself into a room and do something than it is to try to like work with other adults all smart, <laughs> all with lots of great ideas, trying to figure out how to support children. What we know is that it's better for children <laughs> to have multiple adults working together and challenging each other to support those children than it is to have an individual by themselves in a room working with children. The other piece um, in terms of reimagining the student experience, it's, it's on, it's almost there. Um, it's coming, uh, we promise. Uh, but so some, sometimes, the, sometime this spring, um, you know, we'll, we'll have the grand opening of the hub. Um, and we are so excited for the possibilities in this space. Um, as I've always said, you know, Hillbrook as a school has been making long before it was a hip, trendy thing to do, right? Since 1935, we've been a school that's been committed to making. And this space is going to just really open up possibilities and unleash things that um, they're already happening on campus, but given the integration of this space and the opportunity for various people to um, collaborate will be really inspiring. Um, I wanted to quickly show, so th this is the, will be like kind of the main makerspace building and um, just in case you need it there, it is almost there. <laughs> so it's on its way. Um, the, the, uh, they are uh, within, within, a, within a few months, we hope. Um, but so it's, it's exciting, it's moving along. Um, Ken Hay, who's the director of the Hub and a long, long time you know, art teacher at Hillbrook, um, has been very involved with this process and I know he is just like dying to, have, to, to actually get into that space and start to use it. Another major plank from Vision 2020 was to make Hillbrook a destination workplace for educators. And so there was kind of three broad things that were part of that. One, and you'll hear more about this from Margaret and um, Vlado later, but was around compensation and benefits. Um, you know, we know in order to, to be able to attract and retain the best people, we need to provide competitive compensation and we need to provide um, a really a strong benefits package. And so that has dramatically um, improved in the last three to four years. Um, our our uh, compensation is in the top quartile versus our peer schools, which was the target that we set for ourselves. Um, and then in terms of benefits, there's been a whole host of both kind of traditional benefits and then newer benefits. I'll let, I'll let Margaret talk more about that. But we're, you're spending a lot of time thinking about from a compensation and benefits standpoint, like how do you help attract and retain people? 
That's one part. The second part is really having and continuing to have a robust professional development program. Um, you know, we have always been a school that is at the top of our peer set in terms of the amount of money we put towards professional development, but it's also the intentionality with which we approach that. And so over the last um, four to five years, we've spent a lot of time, and it actually started with a conversation with all of the employees around like, what should professional development look like? And, they, and, they, and they, the sense was that there were really three main things that needed to go into that. One was building trusting relationships. Again, if you're going to be a highly collaborative community, if you're going to work together, you have to build those relationships so that you can do that. And the second one was around choice. Like giving people, you know, you know, treating adults, we talk a lot about choice with children, like with adults, like giving people choices around the types of professional development that they need at, at various moments and not assuming that all 80 people, all 80 employees have the same needs at the same time. And then finally, it's about engagement. And so creating opportunities that are, that are engaging and that are active. That there's not a lot of people sitting. Like we're not sitting in, in rooms every, um, every Wednesday afternoon just talking at people. It's, a lot, it's, it's active. And so we've done a lot over the last few years to build that up. Um, you know, got, you know, we have a, but with the Center for Teaching Excellence, our resident teacher program, um, you know, Ilsa Doman and her role as director of teaching and learning and then working closely with, um, you know, Colleen as the associate head of school and Amy and her role and, as well as others spend a lot of time thinking about how they can design meaningful professional development um, and, and meaningful experiences for all of the adults on our campus. Um, in terms of, of some of these photos, what, one of the ones that may be worth noting, the sound project, which many of you have either experienced as a parent or maybe have heard about, which has been a long time partnership in third grade between um, Jenny Jones and Kristen Engineer, Jenny Jones being a science teacher, Kristen Engineer being a music teacher. They've done that now for I think six or seven years. That went international. So, th so they went and they actually, they reproduced the sound project at a, at a school overseas and now they're trying to figure out can, other ways that they can share out the work that they're doing. Um, which, which kind of takes us to the third piece of, of when we think about making Hillbrook a destination workplace, which is creating a culture in which people feel like they can be part of this community for a long time, and that they, as they ha are at different stages in their professional growth, that there are lots of opportunities for them to meet the needs. And again, those look different at different moments in people's lives, and we're really thoughtful about how we do that. Another key t um, piece to the Vision 2020 was creating an increasingly diverse and inclusive community. Um, a big part of that this year was hiring uh, Gulliver Lavage or Gully, um, as our first full-time director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we think about that, you know, direct, uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion was really is three different things. So diversity is numbers. And we are conscious of trying to be a community that reflects the diversity of Silicon Valley. You know, we, we, as we describe in our inclusivity statement, an intentionally diverse community community. And so I, I, um, Margaret, I think, will pro I think provide some of the, a, a little more detail, and it's probably a little bit hard to read on this slide, but um, our, our diversity continues to increase. What's particularly notable, um, or this year in particular, was a significant increase in terms of employee diversity. Um, and so, you know, so we're, we're up to 36% of employees being self-identified people of color, which is significantly higher than, than the typical independent school. We would, of course, continue like, like to see that grow higher, but it's something that we were very conscious of, um, and, we're, and we're seeing that make a difference. Um, the other piece, you know, so you're talking about diversity, um, equity. You know, we, we talk a lot about flexible tuition um, at Hillbrook, and that's certainly one piece of, of an equitable, of, a, of creating an equitable community, making sure that all the people who come to this community have full access to the opportunities. Um, it's also the questions around, so for example, one of the, one of the um, kind of smaller conversations that came up this fall but that was significant was a conversation around religious holidays for employees. And so, the, and so the conversation came up, um, you know, if, if you're a, a Jewish teacher, like, you know, did you have to take a personal day to take Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur? And as a school, we decided that no, that didn't feel right that somebody should have to take a personal day. We weren't necessarily going to take those days off as a school. And at the same time, we wanted to make sure that people, um, and, uh, people with religious beliefs had an opportunity to practice that religion and that, this, and that their work didn't become an impediment to that. That was a small thing. I don't know that we would have had that conversation in quite the way we did without the intentionality that we've been having around conversations around equity the last few years. Um, and so that was really, I think, a, a, a kind of a small but a notable moment for the school. In terms of inclusivity, I threw up the slide from, that we showed for last year's survey. Um, you know, 100% of um, 
people replied either fully included or somewhat included when asked whether or not their child felt included at Hillbrook. That matters to us. Like we're, you know, we're paying attention to how do children feel at the school. Um, and so, and then the other part of that was families and that was 99%. Um, and so, you know, again, like, like th that's important. And, and when we talk about inclusivity, it's that sense of like that you actually do feel like you have a full sense of membership at the school. Um, I also put up f a photo, uh, Gully and Ilsa and Annie are sitting in our new equity and impact lab. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, that's down in the middle school, um, right next to the, uh, to um, Amy Han's office and, and Orla Beatty's middle school office. But that space is, 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 a, is, is still an emerging space, but it's being used in a variety of ways. But it's become a space where we're actually naming the importance. It's where the, you know, the Scott Center is doing work. It's where Gully is doing work. And where we're, we're really focused on equity and impact as a school. And there's a space on campus now um, where people can go and learn about that. So I wanted to take uh, this the, uh, five, 10 minutes to talk a little bit about data. Um, because as a school, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the experiences that we're providing on campus and then trying to figure out like where are we succeeding and, and where can we get better. And one way I wanted to frame that and, and, and a, a piece that, that's unique to this year is that every um, seven years, as a school, we go through an accreditation process with CAIS. So Cal CAIS is the California Association of Independent Schools. And it is a, um, actually how many, actually I could show of hands, like how many people came to visit Hillbrook initially in part because we were a CIS school. I'm, I'm curious. Anybody? Interesting. So, so, so when we as a school think about this, membership in CAIS is incredibly important to us. Um, CAIS is a significant distinguishing characteristic of the top schools in California and then across the country. And so CAIS is a subset of the National Association of Independent Schools. So what does it mean to be an independent school? Um, there's, a whole, you know, there's a whole set of characteristics of independent schools. One of them is an independent board of governors or board of trustees. And again, um, you know, you'll hear briefly from Vlado a little bit later um, talking a little bit about the finances. But within independent schools, that's really important, like having the structure of an independent board of governors. The most significant characteristic of independent schools is they're nonprofits. And so we're schools, so, so we, we, we serve a, a mission that is unique to our school, and it's a mission that's not driven by profit. Um, and, and so again, that, that, is, that is a significant distinguishing characteristic for the school. CAIS is, is a very difficult organization to get accredited by, um, and they do a really great job of then, of like once you're accredited and once you're part of that group, of having like a very thoughtful and serious reaccreditation process. So I, I put the mission statement up. I won't read it, but I will say what I love about this mission statement, particularly given that it's an association, is it's a really it actually resonates a lot with Hillbrook's mission statement um, in terms of. Conversations about deep reflection, analysis, and institutional commitment to action. Um, and then towards the end, the notion of serving both CAIS schools and beyond, like this sense that these schools have an, have an obligation, an opportunity to provide uh, a, a, an educational program and to serve a broader community. So this year we're going through the accreditation process. It's an incredibly intense process. Um, we, we started late last year with putting together a self-study, and so I'll, I'll show you um, this, this is the, the roadmap. Uh, Colleen Shilley is uh, helping to lead the process, and so she provided this roadmap to uh, employees last spring. If you look on the, um, your left side, uh, the, the kind of the key dates right now, we are just finishing up a very intense and long self-study. Um, actually, long is the wrong word. A very intense self-study. It's very involved. Um, and and we are, we're finishing that up. We submit that in December. And then in February, and you'll, you'll hear more about this, but in February, there'll be a visiting committee who comes to campus. And that visiting committee is a, is a series of outside experts, outside educators. It's led by a head of school from another CAIS school. And then there'll be a series of um, CFOs, development officers, um, other division heads, sometimes a teacher. We, I don't know, we don't know yet the makeup, the full makeup of the committee. But it's other people coming from independent schools who volunteer to spend four days which in itself is a very intense process on our campus with us. And so they'll be, they, they visit the campus, they spend time meeting with teachers, they spend time meeting with um, other members of the community, and their job is to read this, the report that we put together and to reflect back to us, like how accurately that report seems to be met as they're kind of talking to people on campus. 
And the report itself, the accreditation report, is very reflective and requires us, and kind of the link here then with data, to, to gather a whole bunch of data about who we are um, and what we're doing well and what we need to work on. And so if we've done that well, um, and we, we would like to think we are doing it well and we're finishing up, if we do that well, the goal will be that when that group comes in, they're gonna look at us and they're gonna, they're gonna look back at us and say, yes, we agree with you. Like, here are the important things that you need to be working on. So, what are, so, so how have we determined that? One of the things that we do, and, and as, as families know, we have a, a long tradition of using employee and family surveys to help us gather feedback. So over the, the last few years, we have um, taken that survey and we've, we've uh, invited an outside group, Pacific Consulting Group, to conduct the survey, to collect all the data, and then to share reports back with us. I shared this survey last spring. So, 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 this, so this is nothing that, um, I mean, some of you may not have seen this, but, but, but this was shared out in May um, at a HSPC meeting. Um, but so, again, you know, as you can see from the survey, the way the survey is structured is it gives you lots of information back and it gives you kind of general satisfaction ratings in broad areas. And then the part that um, you know, they describe as most important is what they call their leverage analysis. And what they say is there are, they, they focus on a couple of your strengths and then a couple of your areas of growth. And they, they suggest that if you focus on those two areas of growth and these two strengths, it will have the biggest impact in terms of satisfaction and in terms of, of meeting the, the needs that people have. And again, you know, surveys, you have lots of information, you have lots of details in a survey. And so trying to make sense of like, where do you prioritize coming out of that? So, in terms of in, uh, terms of like on the positive side, they, they had uh, high ratings in terms of both and, and it's both it's a high rating and it matters to people is the way they come up with the leverage analysis. So, so in theory, something could have a really high rating, but it doesn't matter to anybody. And so that, so that doesn't necessarily rise to the top or it could have a really low rating and not matter to anybody. And so it doesn't rise to the top. So the, the trick is to combine both high, the high rating and, and it's that it's meaningful. And so in terms of the, the, those two things, you know, it's both school leadership and teachers, um, and I particularly would you know, emphasize the second, you know, it's not a surprise, right? Families choose Hillbrook because of the teachers. And, 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 and so we know and we, and we know we need to continue finding ways to celebrate those teachers and, and to make sure that families know and have access to and understand the great work that they're doing. On the other side, um, the, the main piece, and both of these things were closely related, tied to edu educational program and educational skills development. And I'll give you a little more detail um, and, and the, again, a couple more slides that I shared last spring. Um, in terms of educational program, they, it, they particularly showed uh, that we need to think about how we can get better at meeting individual learning needs. And so, for example, suggestions for improvement um, uh, uh, focused on concerns about meeting children's needs and particularly around the, uh, how are we providing challenge. So, you know, what, what do we need to do to better challenge children? Um, the second one, again, quite related, was around the development of the highest individual potential. And again, questions about how, how do we particularly push kids at the top um, it, and in terms of how do we uh, provide additional challenge. So that was some, you know, that's feedback that we've been talking about, and I'll talk, in a moment I'll, I'll circle back to kind of what we're, how we were making sense of that. Um, but again, in, in terms of the broader focus, and part of the reason I'm showing you, and again, I'm only showing you a couple of the slides from the full presentation, is that the notion that like, this is one of the things that we do a lot of is try to pull together this feedback. We also had an employee survey, um, which we also have been using with employees to gather feedback. Another way that we gather data is around two things. One is the ERB, and then the second is um, surveys of high school students. And so uh, Ilsa and Amy, and Colleen, and I'm leaving somebody out, but, but a whole, a whole uh, Eden. Eden, sorry, Eden, a whole, a whole, um, did a presentation about a month ago, and hopefully, hopefully some of you attended, um, where we shared out kind of how we were using this data. So again, this is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the types of data that we're using. Um, for example, with ERB data, which is on the upper corner, um, you know, we will look at across each subject subtest, a grade level, um, and how that grade level score, their, the group norm, which is the norm of all of the children in that class, compares to the independent school norm, which is um, you know, the most competitive um, subset that you, could, that you would compare those scores to. And again, what we're looking at is, is our expectation is that we should be about the same or slightly ahead of, of, our, of our peer schools. 
and that and when we look at that data we are um, the other one that's actually we use internally in particular which is particularly interesting is tracking the tracking over the years and so again particularly with data like being able to look over time with a cohort or with individual students is actually more is usually more helpful than any one year and so for example that lower corner what you'll see is is you, we can look at a cohort and in this case that happens to be it's quantitative reasoning for last year's eighth grade and so the um, brown is independent norm the green is um, our, is, is uh, our norm, is our, is our group, and you can see how they compared to the independent norm over a five-year period. And so again, most years they were either slightly on or slightly ahead. And the other piece that we're looking at in there is to see growth over time. And so you would expect to see um, an increase. So for example, if you look from 2018 to 2019, an increase from 706 to 750, you would expect to see an increase in the range of 30 to 40 points year over year. You don't always see it. And so you, you know, part of this is, that again, like if you don't see it, then huh, you, you can ask questions and try to understand that. But, it, but the key here is like, this is the kinds of data that we're looking at as teachers and, and as senior leaders, trying to understand how, how children are doing, how cohorts are doing, and then how our program is doing. The other set of data then that, we, that we've particularly been using the last few years is, is um, feedback from high school students. And so we, we survey high school freshmen and try to get a sense, first of all, of things like math placement, and again, it's a very concrete thing that you can track. Um, and so, for example, as you can see over time, um, you, you know, there's, it's pretty steady around where our math placement is. And the, uh, the other piece of this that we don't have, I don't have on this slide, but one of the other things we often look at as well is then we then ask like, so what does it look like in the typical high schools? Like what do they expect it to be? I, I will say that's a harder question to answer than it sounds because high like different high schools do it very differently. So, when we're, and we're sending them to, I think last year we sent them to like 14 different high schools or something. So, 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 so it's, it can be a little tricky in general, what we've tried to track, and again, in mostly you're looking at um, algebra or algebra accelerated versus geometry, we have tracked, and, and at least what we continue to hear and what statistically we're seeing is that our students are entering those classes in, in at a slightly more competitive than you would expect from an outside, from a cohort coming in. And so that feels like we're trending in the right direction. And at the same time, um, it's something that we continue to look at. And then we ask a number of qualitative questions around student experience. And so for example, um, you know, the study skills I developed while at Hillbrook have been adequate in helping me meet the challenges of high school. And then you can see, and, then, and again, part of this for us is like also tracking this year over year. Again, any one cohort is interesting, but it, you know, it isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily provide us a lot of information. By looking at this year over year, we can see if there are things that are jumping out that, that we're perhaps not meeting. And then the other piece to this, you know, to, to, and I don't want to get to get lost, is it's the in life, in the school and life component of this, it's the, it's the truly qualitative. And so I, um, hopefully many of you have seen our videos that we do with seniors. And, we, you know, they, and typically they're, they're interviewed when they come back for the alumni reunion, their senior years become kind of a thing. So you get a lot, actually a lot of seniors come back for that event because they know they're going to get videotaped for the, for the senior video. And it's, but it's this wonderful opportunity to, you know, four years out to get feedback from students on, that exp on their experience. Experience. And I'm always um, both moved and amazed by how they're able to speak to the experience they had at Hillbrook um, and the consistency in the types of things that you hear. And again, you know, we're, we're as a school and your hopes as parents is that we're providing children skills for life. When I hear those seniors year after year, it's clear to me that they have the academic foundation, but that also it's those intangibles, and it's those intangibles they talk about that are making the difference, that made the difference in high school, and it's also what's those intangibles that they are um, thinking about as they head off to college. <laughs> Final piece in terms of data analysis is our program audit process. And, and this is something that actually came out of Vision 2010, um, 2015. Um, so a number of years ago, back in like 2010, 2011, we were trying to think about like, how do we create a structure where we can on a regular basis review programs, which is not overwhelming and is helpful. And so the idea of like reviewing every program every year was overwhelming and not very helpful. And so the idea was to create a process where you could kind of really hone in on specific programs and do a deep dive. Um, it's 
and uh, Ilsa Doman, um, in her role as Director of Teaching and Learning, has done a lot the last few years also to really um, hone that process. I encourage you, if you, there's a document over here which has been written which kind of describes the audit process in detail, but it's an incredibly thoughtful process. It, it's a very inclusive process. We, we use data, um, surveys, ERB data, a lot, of the, a lot of that information, but it's also a lot of conversation with our, you know, our teachers and their expertise, generating sets of questions that they are curious about um, at, you know, in terms of, of the way their programs are operating, and then circling back and then ultimately sharing out with the full community the types of changes. It, it, it has been a really powerful way to um, empower teachers um, and also lead to real meaningful change in our program. So based on all of that, um, what types of things are we thinking about? And, and I, uh, this is kind of an overview slide, but uh, what I would suggest and what we've been thinking about coming out of um, the CAS accreditation process is on the other end of that process, after they've come, after they give us their report back, we will be asked to essentially come up with a this, the start of a strategic plan. So the timing couldn't be better. We're, we're coming to the end of Vision 2020, um, and we're getting ready um, you know, to, have to launch our own strategic planning process next year. So we will have survey data, we'll have the CAIS accreditation feedback, and we have, we'll have lots of information. And already we know like some of the questions that, that are likely to come out of that are the following. So for example, you know, how might we continue to explore how we can best challenge each child to reach their highest potential in school and in life? Continue to evolve our Reach Beyond programming. Build on the early success of the Scott Center and ensure its continuing development both here at Hillbrook and beyond. Improve feedback and evaluation systems. And I'll take a second, I, I, we haven't talked as much, the other ones I think I've kind of talked about, but, but that one, that's coming out of, that's something that's really coming out of uh, employees really wanting both, so there, that's both an employee facing conversation about how do we provide feedback to employees and have, have helpful conversations um, around their professional growth, and it's also coming out of the student side. I mean, you know, so how do we continue to better provide feedback and, and partner with families and children in their educational journey. And so, that, so I think both, that, that ca captures both of those things. Um, deepen and extend our work in DEI. Again, um, you know, we've made lots of strides these last few years in, our, in the work we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and um, you know, we, are, we wanna make sure that that continues and we're excited to see where that can go, particularly with um, new leadership from Gully. Uh, create more opportunities for family engagement and education. Um, so one of the things, and it, again, over here there's a copy which I'd encourage you to take um, uh, on your way out, is a, is a list of all of the parent education opportunities this year. We have been very intentional, and again, um, Colleen and, and Amy and Ilsa and others in, in our program leadership team have put a lot of thought into how do we uh, create a, a meaningful set of program um, uh, parent education opportunities to really engage parents and partner with parents. And so for example, you know, we did the ERB workshop recently. Um, we've done uh, you know, a, a series of more grade level specific events that will happen throughout the year. I strongly encourage you to, um, to pay attention to Common Ground. Um, you know, Hillbrook doesn't run Common Ground, but you know, Common Ground is a fabulous organization. We have some really strong Hillbrook leadership in that organization, but it provides amazing, um, amazing parent education opportunities. And you know, it's the benefits of having a lot a lot of schools come together and invite people um, that as an individual school it's much harder to get. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, it, you know, and it's a, a, a small line but it's a big question, um, you know, how might we develop a Hillbrook Secondary School that is an extension of our existing program? Um, and so we are in the second year, we, uh, the, the, we have a, um, a board level uh, task force that's in its second year, which is looking at that question. And we have board members, we have uh, employees, we have some other community members who've been on this journey with us over the last 18 months, trying to understand a couple of things. Um, a one, like what is the market and the demand? Like is, is there a need for a high school? Um, and then, you know, if, so, if yes, like would Hillbrook and what we think we would become fit that? Um, what are the, uh, um, what are the challenges? So one of the things we did last year is we visited a whole series of schools that had, that had been JK-8 schools and had added high schools. And so they, uh, we visited those schools to, to better understand some of them, as some of you may know, for example, Nueva, um, you know, which is about you know, 45 minutes north of here, incredibly successful um, and, and lots of challenges that they still had with that process. 
some of the other schools we visited, not quite as successful. Like, you know, you know kind of rocky starts. Uh, some of them are 20, 20 years into the process. All are doing fine, and yet it was helpful for us to get a sense of like, ooh, this is, you know, th there's, here's some of the challenges, here's some of the pitfalls that you might avoid if you move forward this process. Um, so this year, we're continuing down that path. Um, you know, we're looking to develop essentially some, uh, a business plan. Um, and at some point, and we don't know exactly when that is, um, you know, the board will have to make a decision about whether or not we're really gonna push forward on this process, um, or we're going to say, well, it sounds interesting, but it's not the right thing for the school right now. Um, one of the things that I want to note about that, and one of the, I'm actually particularly proud of the way that the board has helped to, to facilitate this process, um, coming out of vision, uh, the process for Vision 2020, one of the biggest questions that was out there that we did not answer was whether or not the school should have a secondary school. And part of the reason we didn't answer it back in 2015 was we looked at ourselves and we were like, I don't, like, like sure, like if you, if you just, just said tomorrow you could like have a campus and it would all be set up and running, like okay, maybe. Um, but we were not prepared. We had no idea how to answer that question. And so we tabled it. Like, you know, we said, you know what, there's a lot of other things that we need to do as a school. We're not prepared to have that conversation. We know now as we head into Vision 2025 or whatever it's going to be called, that we have the information that we need now to actually make that decision. And so, so part of the process of the last um, 18 months and, and continuing on is to make sense of that and then, and then to um, decide what we do moving forward. So how can you support our efforts? <laughs> um, well, first of all, you're here, so thank you. Um, and and, and it's, it's wonderful to have um, people here and audience. Also, those of you who are um, you know, paying attention online, um, that makes a difference. Um, but uh, in particular, admissions, you know, we, yeah, word of mouth. We had our uh, open house this past Saturday. It was a wonderful, beautiful Saturday. Lots of people there, um, many of you, uh, many parents you know, in attendance, of course, many students. 80 plus percent of families who who come to Hillbrook still come through word of mouth. Um, and so we ask you to, you know, to, knowing that, you know, share your Hillbrook story and, 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 and share your experience with your friends and, and other people because it makes a difference. Um, participate, and so you're here, but I also would encourage you to participate you know, in, these, in these events that we're putting together. Um, the next one is a math education event on Wednesday, December 11th. Um, you know, please come out to that, and it'll be an opportunity to actually, it'll be a hands, there'll be some hands-on components to that, as well as um, you know, you know, some, some educational components. So we encourage you to come participate in that, as well as others. Um, and then finally, engage with our communication efforts. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways we try to communicate with families. Um, Hillbrook Happening, Hillbrook Quarterly, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and um, I've just started. I'm taking a little bit of a risk, you know, based on the theme of this year. Um, I, you know, keep expectations low, um, but uh, a new podcast. Um, and so, in addition to writing and remarks and reflections, which I know you all read religiously, um, there'll be a podcast version of that. But it, it is an effort again to create other ways to engage people in the conversations we're having at school. So I welcome feedback on that. We welcome feedback on any of this um, uh, in terms of the the various uh, ways in which we're communicating with you. Um, and if you have ideas for other ways that we can communicate with you, we'd love to hear them. So um, with that, I will have time for questions at the end, but um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Vlado Herman. Thank you, Mark. There you go. Uh, I think I know many of you, but for the folks who don't know me, I am the plus one of support Herman, uh, probably. <laughs> um, I'm Lotto Herman. I, uh, it's my seventh year on the board, seventh year on the finance committee. Um, I spent the last, I was just thinking on the car right here, the last 30 years, the majority of my waking hours working in finance, for profit finance. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a little uh, discouraging, but I've now made it my uh, goal in life to spend the next 30 years not doing as much of that and focusing on other things. But I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's been a real honor to serve on the board, and especially in finance. I've learned a ton. Uh, Not-for-profit accounting, it's been a, a real eye-opener, and um, we're all here for the kids, and we all know what makes the school great are our teachers, and with that, we... You know, that's really kind of what focuses us on the financial model and our governance and all the things we do. Um, so with that, here is the agenda. 
I will speak about financial governance and Margaret, our esteemed CFO. We're very fortunate to have Margaret here. Um, we went through a pretty lengthy interview process five plus years ago. Margaret stood out and um, she's made my life much easier and she's made this school an incredible place. So thank you, Margaret, for that. Um, to me, this meeting is almost akin to a annual meeting for a public company, even for even a, just a private company. They have annual meetings where shareholders come, um, get the spiel uh, from the CEO and the CFO, and then they ask questions. Um, so to me, if everyone here is like a shareholder. You contribute quite a bit of money to this school. Um, it's not cheap to pay a full price to come to Hilbert. I think we're all very cognizant of that. Uh, we want to attract and retain the best teachers we can and staff. Um, so this is your school. You, uh, everyone here has an equal vote, just like I have a vote, like Mark has a vote. You're all, we're all in this together. We're all in it to uh, make this a incredible place. I just saw a study on a, um, it's a Twitter, it's a new startup my friend is starting to uh, be like Twitter. It's just very few people on it, but someone posted an article that by the time your kids are 18, you've spent 93% of your time with your children up to the age of 18. So after that, I don't know, there were different studies that came out with that and different, culturally that could be different, but you know, these first 18 years are what you get and hopefully they'll come and say hi to you after you have know, to college. And ask for, I know some kids do move back after college, but um, these are the important years and um, I'm sure enjoying it. So I have an eighth grader, Sarah, uh, she'll be going to Las Gatos High next year. That's what she claims. Uh, I think that's the plan now. And David's in sixth grade. So we've been here since JK. So it's been a long, uh, fun journey. Oh, I wanted to make a plug too on the Reach Beyond slides, Mark. I saw you had a, in the bottom left, uh, My New Red Shoes. And I didn't realize that's one of our um, organizations. My, uh, my good friend's wife started that about 10 years ago out of Menlo Park. And we've been involved in that um, as a family, but it's a really great organization. Uh, ensures that um, kids from disadvantaged areas have a new pair of shoes to start school, which is, yes. um, I didn't think much of it once you started it, and now that I'm involved in it, it, it's an amazing change to a child's first day of school because confidence and the ability to, and kids judge each other, and shoes are a big part of our culture. Um, and the stories that we hear from that organization are really cool. So it was nice to see that. Mm -hmm. um, Board of Trustees, we have a fiduciary duty um, to the school. What does fiduciary mean? We hear that a lot now in politics, right? Our politicians have a fiduciary duty to us as citizens, as voters. Um, we have 18 members of our board. We have a full, we have the ability to have 18 members. We have 18 members. Um, we have three new members this year. Two of them are on the finance committee, uh, Theodora and Layla right here, welcome. And we have a third one, Rita. So we have three new female members of our board. We're very happy, very excited. Um, fiduciary is, in essence, you trust us that we, we have the trust of the school um, on our shoulders. Um, there's a famous HR person named Patty McCord, who's the first HR person at Netflix, and she has a hundred slide uh, deck um, that's very famous, you can find it on, on the internet. But her, she came up with one expense policy for the entire Netflix that's there to this day. Act in the best interest of Netflix. That's it. So there's no specific items, you can only spend this, that. I think they abridged it a bit, but so for us as board members, we have to act in the best interest of Hillbrook. Um, and we look to ourselves to do that. Um, we keep each other in check. We ask questions of each other. We ask questions of Margaret. People ask questions of me. New board members come on board and think they're asking silly questions, but they're not asking silly questions because we should always be asking questions. And that's why it's great to have new board members um, who challenge. I've been here seven years just because we did something seven years ago it doesn't mean we should be doing it the same way today. So I appreciate the new questions. I don't roll my eyes even though people think I do, but I'm, I'm very open. And Margaret's great about taking questions. It's in <laughs> once every three years from the board members. Thank you for that. Um, our, um, we meet monthly. These are all the great things we do. We do, and Margaret will go through our, um, we do have an endowment policy because we have an endowment that's close to $3 million now, which is awesome. When I joined 
10 years ago, we did not have an endowment. Um, and so we have a specific uh, policy around that. We have a very conservative policy. We're not in the, mind, in the business of investing and making large returns. We're in the business of preserving that capital to ensure that endowment can do great things in the future as it grows. Um, we are under audit. Our Menino is our auditor. They audit many um, uh, independent and parochial private schools in the area. So it's really nice to have Mario go through some of the data they share. Um, for us as being clients, we've had a, I don't know what number, uh, I mean, this is the seventh straight year that we've had a clean audit. Mm -hmm. And um, clean means we have no material deficiencies or significant uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. Uh, that means we'll well run school. And going through an audit's not an easy thing. Margaret mm -hmm. spends quite a bit of time with an in house, the auditor comes on site, um, we get a full report, um, and it's great. So thank you, Margaret, for that. Welcome. Um, transparency, we issue, we have an annual report, we have an annual tax filing that just was prepared. Thank mm -hmm. you, Margaret, for that. Um, even, we, even though we are not for profit, we still have to do a annual tax filing. Um, I think that's all I have. And I'll turn awesome. it over to Margaret. Awesome, thank talk you. talk about our uh, financial snapshot, yeah. thank you. I'd... Thank you. I don't need this, right? No, you don't. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here. Uh, thank you, Votto, for those kind words and the introduction. Uh, like Votto, I spent about 25 years in the for-profit world as well. So I, this is my sixth school year, and I absolutely love being here. And this is one of my favorite events to be. Um, the parent community, uh, how well run and um, the financial strength and and just all the different details of all the progress we're making on all the different strategies that mark talked about so let me go through Oop, not yet hold on okay so this is just a financial s snapshot of hillbrook our fiscal year end is june 30th 2019 that was our last audit period uh, and then on the right compared to june 30th it's 2018 so the first three lines, assets, liabilities, and net worth, which is just assets, less liabilities. Um, 21 million is our, our assets, and that's primarily our fixed assets, so our property and land, along with um, contributions receivable on our re most recent capital campaign. So those are the largest components, as well as technology and furniture. And then liabilities of the seven and a half million, that's mainly deferred the uh, tuition that's been collected by June 30th. It actually applies to the next year. Should we actually classify that as a liability until we actually uh, are in the next fiscal year? And then um, also some accrued salaries. We pay our teachers over a 12 month period, but as of June 30, when the school year ends, we accrue what we pay them during the summer. So that's also a component of liabilities. And then our net worth, uh, we grew about a million dollars last year. And the primary reason for that was a lot of the investments that we made in uh, our new hub that will be online next spring. And then endowment, as Votto said, we're at 2.9 million, just under 3 million. And since I've been here, uh, it, it has tripled and, and grown substantially since Votto's been here. So that's been very exciting to begin investing that uh, externally in very safe investments and, and seeing that continue to grow. Operating expense wise, we're about 15 million. That's about an 8% increase over the prior year. And then student enrollment up substantially, 361 to 385, about just about 6.6%. Um, so as we uh, will get to a slide in a moment so you can see the different, different components of that, but that's related to our conditional use permit growth and as we're adding that third section in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Tuition assistance has been another metric that we've uh, enjoyed seeing increase as we increase um, our commitment to that strategy, so up, up to 1.6 million. And then you can see the acres and square footage that hasn't changed, but next year we'll be excited that that square footage will be about 55,000 once our hub comes online. So any questions on that? Okay, great. And then financial overview. Left-hand pie chart is our revenue and the right-hand side of expense. 
Not surprising, tuition is our largest uh, revenue item and salaries and benefits is our, are our largest expense item. And uh, the other key component of revenue is voluntary support. Um, thank you for everyone in this room and listening. Um, it's a key component of our business model as well as all of our peer schools and many schools in general. And then on the, on the expense side, um, uh, flexible tuition is our second largest expense item. And so, and then the third is instructional supplies and services, and that's basically any expense that's touching the student. So everything from the school supplies to field trips to technology and all the different things that they're utilizing. And then once you get past those three big categories, the other items are, are fairly non-discretionary. It's the non-cash depreciation of our fixed assets and buildings, uh, the repair and maintenance to uh, maintain everything, and then um, insurance and utilities and professional fees. And then professional development is 2% that Mark talked about that we're, uh, uh, that we're spending for faculty and staff to continue training opportunities. And then others about 2%, and that's mainly website, advertising, admission events, and fundraising events, and parent events. So the, the tuition setting process is a long process, but, um, but we always are, um, I, it's one of my favorite time of year just because we're uh, dealing with data and getting a lot of data. The September, October is very busy. Uh, we, could, we prepare about, we participate in about three surveys. One's the NAIS survey, the Kalispoa survey, which is the, the CFO version of CAIS. Um, and then also a new index survey, which is a different association Mark and I joined on behalf of the school that are some top performing uh, national schools, so a subset of, of NAIS schools. So we can prepare those and then November, December, we, we get the results, we look at it, we benchmark ourselves, where are we performing well, where, where can we do better? And then we also are using that data to determine how we're going to set targets into our long-term financial model as we begin setting tuition for next year, as well as looking beyond um, over a multi-year time period. And then December, January, we actually, after we meet with the finance committee a few times, we also meet with the board, uh, present our recommendations for the next year's tuition. But at that time, we're also showing them impact overall uh, to our, to our uh, f financial statements as well as uh, beyond. So the peer schools that we look at, there's 18, and they're in the Bay Area, and not just the South Bay, but really San Francisco down to San Jose, uh, because when we think about uh, you know schools that are like us, high-performing schools, we're attracting families um, to the Bay Area. So when faculty are coming, they're they're looking at San Francisco schools. They may be looking in Los Gatos. So. Uh, these are the schools that when I arrived that Mark had been uh, measuring and so at least a dozen years that we've been looking at this data. And then uh, we'll get into some slides uh, in a moment um, that that looks at a lot of these different metrics. But when we, when we were participating in Vision 2020 and uh, the, the great graphic that Mark showed earlier, what I was thinking about is what are the metrics that we can be looking at and holding ourselves accountable for, you know, as we go through the Vision 2020 period. And so the four different strategies of ensuring operational excellence and financial sustainability, we can look at how are we growing enrollment? You know, what are we charging for tuition? What is our voluntary giving? You know, how are, is our endowment and debt? And then destination workplace, how, how are we benchmarking uh, as far as faculty salaries and how are we measuring on professional development? So as we go through these slides, it will um, align with uh, these different strategies. So enrollment by grade, this is a five-year snapshot of each year, every grade uh, number is a little bit different and you'll see at the top, uh, 2015-16, we were still at 315. We were at that for many, many years. And upon the approval of our new CUP, we began growing in 2016-17. And then 17, 18, 19, the last three years, we've added the third sections in 6th, 7th, and 8th. 
And our financial model really contemplates, even though we have approval to be at 414, uh, maintaining around a 385 in our financial model just for conservatism. And we also feel like that's the right size uh, to operate the school. Tuition, the left-hand graph is the absolute tuition. The right-hand uh, graph is the tuition percent increase. So when you look at the peer median of our 18 schools, and then on the blue is, is Hillbrook, We've been uh, at or, or near, a little, sometimes we're a little bit higher for the absolute tuition, <coughs> although tuition increases were slightly lower or at. So, but, but the point is uh, we're, we're tracking and making sure that we're not an outlier on either side. And then this is a lot of numbers, but it just gives you a sense of the different tuitions that our peers are charging. So these are on their websites. This is not confidential data, but it's, it's for, for several years, we were right at median, so right smack in the middle. And then the last few years, we've been um, slightly higher. Um, this year, we're about $170 over the peer median for 2019-20. Um, but I, one thing I thought was interesting is just looking at 13-14, the spread of the highest tuition of 35,007 versus the lowest of 17,000. It was about double between the high and the low. And then looking out to 1920. Um, I think some of the schools that have been at the lower end of tuition over the last seven years have grown a little bit faster and towards the top and the middle have grown more in that four to five percent range. Uh, shifting to voluntary giving, voluntary giving is extremely strong at Hillbrook and it shows the three-year trends. The biggest component of, of uh, voluntary giving is the annual fund. And the other, the second highest is our auction or our benefit. Uh, and then the other events are the walkathon and the family fund night. So the right hand side shows the percent of our total revenue. We showed 11% on that prior slide. And you can see it's been around that same percent over the last three years. And then uh, last year was a significant um, uh, year for us for voluntary giving. And then participation is our favorite number. Uh, it doesn't matter the, the gift. I mean, the time and talent and, and, and the funds that are given to the school um, all matter. And historically, both from a family, trustee, and employee perspective, uh, we've had participation that's um, at the highest benchmark of any of our peer schools. And then another place that we do stick out is per student, uh, in a good way, um, annual fund per student over the last three years. The peer average on the left, the, in the blue, the peer median, and then Hillbrook on the right. Um, consistently, uh, we uh, benchmark higher than our peer schools, and, and that's important because it's, it, it leads to a, a, a stronger investment in our programs. And then this slide is endowment uh, versus peers and debt versus peers. So the left-hand side is endowment and the right-hand side is, is debt. And on the left, when we're talking about endowment, the blue, uh, we've grown from 2.1 million to 2.9 million over the last three years. And you can see our peers um, are also growing. So the peer average uh, for 2019-20 is 10.2 million, uh, but the peer median is slightly lower, 6.9 million. So we're, we're making strides and um, we're very happy with our growth, but um, many of our peers do have higher endowments. But conversely, on the debt side, um, we've had no debt uh, over the last three years and our peers um, have some significant debt. Um, it is decreasing a little bit, but the peer average you can see is just over 11 million in this year, uh, or as of June 30, 19, and then the peer median was 7.4 million. So um, there is, we believe, a, a strong correlation. All of the buildings and, and growth that you see at Hillbrook has been funded uh, through capital campaigns and through the cash flow of our operations. So it's something um, we're, we're proud of and um, We'll be, we'll be talking about this in a, in a couple of slides, but uh, we'll, next year we'll have a little bit, of, a few million dollars of debt that we've chosen to um, 
uh, do related to our hub construction, just to continue to enable us to invest uh, our endowment reserves, as well as grow some other uh, reserves uh, for facilities and operations. Moving to diverse and inclusive environment or in a community. So the first thing is flexible tuition model. So about three years ago, we uh, shifted from tuition assistance being a discount to, to the verbiage of flexible tuition to make it more approachable for people to apply for flexible tuition. It's paying based on an individual need of what you can afford. And then the second component of the flexible tuition program was including that support beyond tuition, not just a discount on tuition, but uh, making sure that anything they wanted to participate paid in at Hillbrook, there was that proportional support. So whether that's extended care, whether that's going on an international trip or participating in enrichment. So it's been, uh, been a really great um, uh, transition. And then as far as the percent of students, as well as the percent of our revenue that is allocated to flexible tuition, uh, this is a five-year trend. 23% uh, in fiscal year 20 of our student population are, have some level of support for flexible tuition. That could be 30,000, it could be 5,000. On at, because as a percent of revenue, it's 14%. That indicates, on average, it's around 50 to 60 percent. So, um, uh, as far as an award to the total tuition, but the but the flexible flexible tuition has grown substantially over the last five years. And this is the absolute dollars uh, this year: 1.9 million, or 14 percent of our revenue, uh, the highest level in history. And then flexible tuition versus our peers. We are benchmarking uh, slightly lower than the peer average as well as the peer median, but we're, we're closing the gap. And this is through 2017. Um, actually, that's through 2017, uh, 18, 19. I have a typo on that slide. Uh, and then for 2020, we're at 14%. So I'm hopeful that next year that we'll be at either average or median or, or much closer than we even are this year. So that's um, exciting. It, in, and when you look at the peer averages and peer medians, you know, some years they're up, but some years they're a little bit down, but they have been ranging in that 13 to 14 percent. So long term in our financial model, we're hoping to reach 14, you know, kind of maintain that number and um, make sure that see how we're, we're tracking on that each year. Uh, Mark had this slide on one of his in his presentation. This is a little bit bigger. Uh, we are um, uh, happy that students of color represent 43%. That's up a percent from the prior year. And then you can see the, um, uh, the ethnicity and um, race on the right-hand side. So the largest is multiracial, followed by Asian. And then looking at employee, faculty, and trustee. Uh, again, three-year trend of... Uh, employees of color, faculty of color, and trustees of color, uh, and particularly for 1920, making significant strides in uh, that initiative. And then looking at all four together, so trustees, faculty, employees, students, the green being Caucasian, and then blue, um, uh, people of color, the highest diversity is among our students, 43%. And as Mark mentioned, it, it's, a, it's a goal to continue increasing both in trustees and employees so that we're reflective of the community that, that we're serving. And then when you think about reimagining the student experience and if, is there a financial metric really to measure that? It, it's hard to measure. Um, obviously, we have significant investments uh, in our Reach Beyond programs and Reach Beyond Week. And, and just thinking about the capital campaign in general, that's a large metric that we can definitely measure as far as the amazing projects that we've been able to implement and the student outcome of being able to utilize these, these great spaces and also great programs. So um, it's, uh, I arrived in July of 14, so it's, it's very exciting to see uh, the, the big improvements that we've made uh, from the stage to the science classroom to the playground launching the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship, uh, more recently um, uh, reaching a million dollars in our flexible tuition 
uh, endowment and then hub to hopefully open in February of 2020. And then shifting to destination workplace, um, faculty salaries is something that we uh, definitely measure, want to make sure that we're at uh, the, the top of our, our quartile for many years before I got here. We were, we were in those, those lower two quad, quadrants and being at median was the goal. And then as we've been going through the last five years, we've made significant strides to get at or near the top. Last year, we were right to the right of the 75%. This year, we're right to the left. I think we're exactly where the 75 is and then the dot next to it, it's $100 more. So it's not a big range, but the range from the lowest end to the highest end is about $40,000. So it's very interesting to see um, uh, the, um, the diversity of the median, median salary of all the faculty at, at, at our different peer schools. There's kind of a large cluster in the 25 to 50% range and then several in that 75% range. But we feel um, very good of, of maintaining our, our position in that spot. And then professional development per student. This is one where we always stand out um, at the top. Uh, the investment per student that we're spending for our staff and faculty uh, versus the peer average is, is, is substantial. And then student-teacher ratios. Um, obviously, this is important to all of you in the room, but it's also important to teachers and to the students. Uh, we are at 6.9, and this has been a very similar number in, in prior years. The peer median is at 8, and then you can see, I don't name the schools because we have confidentiality in our peer survey, uh, but you can see you know, they range everything from just under 6 to um, near, just over 11. So there's a, a broad range, but we... Um, We've been at 6.9, 7.2 the last few years. And then several initiatives. We, we shared this last year, but it's important because we're still very uh, proud about these more substantial initiatives that we launched last year. And what's, what we loved about these particular initiatives is it's kind of hitting our employees in the different quadrants of careers that they're in, whether it's a new employee with student loan, uh, or younger employee of student loan pay down assistance to um, the more experienced employee that may be looking at retirement in a few years and then everything in between of, of um, having children and, and buying their first home. And so um, there's uh, lots of other um, different things that we do, whether it's lunch leftovers to having snacks or never ending fruit bowl, but um, definitely, uh, professional development and benefits um, as we're talking to employees is the things that they definitely have positive feedback on. So in summary, last slide, uh, uh, we really want to focus on our financial targets that drive, that drive and relate to our strategic uh, vision 2020. We're really looking at careful student growth over the last several years and we'll continue to do that. We're focused on destination workforce. It's our biggest asset besides our campus is our, our faculty and employees, making sure we're attracting and retaining the top talent. Um, really a lot of focus on looking at tuition. We, we understand it's, it's a high tuition. M balancing flexible tuition with modest tuition increases is important and that's something we're spending, actually the finance committee has a key goal on of really looking at that long term of how we can manage that. And we're, we're so grateful for the voluntary giving uh, in our community. And it's been exciting to um, uh, see our endowment grow, begin investing the endowment. And, um, and, and with that, the, the consideration of debt that we will be taking on this year uh, over a 10-year amortization that's very manageable is going to allow us to continue growing those operating reserves and just give us the financial strength as well as flexibility to implement all the different programs that Mark shared and that we're um, excited about doing. So with that, any we're here to answer any questions that you may have <laughs> to anyone. Power outages in the past uh, you know, couple months, and certainly moving forward, how does that impact you know 
financials, or just like how, how do you consider how you evolve to manage that? That's a good question. I, uh, finan you, you could, I, I don't know if there's a huge financial impact in terms, <laughs> but, but it's a good question, but there might be something I'm missing. I mean, but we've gotten generated, we've been doing some of that. I think certainly like trying to figure out, like as, you know, as people here know, we headed into that with like, well, you can't be open in a power outage. Mm -hmm. And then pretty quickly along with all of the schools are like, well, if they're gonna tell us that there's gonna be power outages every couple of weeks, at least in theory, like you can't be closed every time that the power goes out. So we pivoted quickly. Um, and you know, and as, a, as you kind of saw in real time with the information we were sending out, like trying to figure out how to do that, we haven't obviously done it yet. Um, the types of things that we've been focused on uh, would be, you know, like making sure that like the phones, like kind of like the basic structures are working and so we have some generators and, um, but the reality is, you know, it'll be dark. You know, we'll be, we'll be in dark classrooms. And again, of course, the way we're laid out as a campus makes that feel manageable. Um, you know, there's lots of light and like every, there's every, every room opens to the outside, right? So I'm like a school at like big hallways and things like which would feel probably ominous. You know, I think at Hillbrook, we're outside a lot. So it feels like it's gonna be manageable, but we're thinking about it um, and, uh, we're hopeful that um, PG&E or whatever happens in the in the broader state um, is solved quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mark, yes. I have a question about the flexible tuition. Yes. Do we know how many families are having to turn down Hillbrook because they're not Good getting question. the financial assistance they need? Um, we. Mark, Mark, could you repeat the question for? Yes. Our how many families are? We turning down? Is that no, what your no, no. question? How many families are turning yeah. us they down they because they yeah? Because they're not yeah. getting the, the assistance they need. Yeah. So how many families um, have, not enrolled. have not enrolled? Because so I think what you're asking is like if, so families who we have we have said you can you know we we'd love you here. Yes. They don't qualify for flexible tuition or don't qualify or for a certain amount of flexible tuition. They, they, they then say to us, we'd love to be here, but we can't afford it. Yeah. Is that, yeah. <laughs> I'd say there's there's always a handful, but we we try our best to fund what people need, and uh, we utilize SSS, which is a, a program um, was uh, under NAS that many independent schools um, utilize that does the calculation of of what they can afford and. Mark and I sit on the committee as well as a longtime consultant that's worked with the school that was a past parent of the school. And um, I would say it's, it's, I don't think it's really grown a lot. I mean, it's fairly consistent in my last six years here. It's um, but, a very, very small number. Yeah. We just started tracking the data mm -hmm. in the last mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. so it's a, but it's a small number, right? Yeah. And, and what I can say is, but the, the amount of people that are applying has grown. And, and then that's reflective in the numbers of the amount of the awards that we're giving out. Um, well, I think as we've changed our messaging around flexible tuition, we've had more families apply, which was the hope. Yeah. You know, so when you see those, you see yeah. that trending upwards, like that was by design. But, but I mean, I, I also think partly what you're, so we recognize and like schools in general recognize that there is this, I don't know what you want to call it, group, middle class, whatever you want to call it, that, 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 and, and again, and particularly in an area like this where with high housing prices and things like that, like, that high incomes may or may not mm -hmm. translate to an ability to afford a school like ours. Mm -hmm. And so we're paying a lot of attention to it. Um, the SSS tries to translate to some mm -hmm. degree. Um, and but so SSS is this outside service that we send it away to. They try to translate to some degree, like like the reality of your market versus say Des Moines, Iowa or something, where that could be very different um, reality. And so it translates to something, but again, in the end, Margaret, mostly I sometimes get involved, but you know, does a really nice job with families of trying to have that conversation and really trying to make sense of like, so what, what is it you can afford? You know, what does SSS mm -hmm. say? Um, you know, how far apart are those two things and, and trying to figure that out. But. And the other thing is, I think a few years ago, as we launched flexible tuition, we saw a lot more families which had not been hardly any in my first few years starting to apply for flexible tuition that were currently here. And maybe they qualified for some, or maybe they had some family support before, but now they don't have family support. That's tapered off a little bit in the last few years. We haven't seen as much of that, um, but there's an application process every year. And so um, fa sometimes families are, are on flexible tuition and then they roll off, or it could be the opposite. It's just depending on what financial situation they're going through. So it's a... 
Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other questions? I think Eric had a question. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, so Mark, I was wondering how you um, measure the efficacy of the, some of the changes you make for your programs through things like audits or, or plans. Mm -hmm. It just, um, so it seems like the audit, several recommendations are made. Yep. And it seems like it would be difficult to tie success of a student to a change that's made in the program. There's no control group really where you know, kids that go through the program without changes and kids that do so. How yeah. is that measured and what's this kind of cycle time? A good question. So I, um, so I think with the work, and you mentioned, I mean, audits is... is Mark, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so the question was, um, let's see if I can capture this. The, 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 the question was, how do we track uh, the efficacy of, of program change? You know, we have a lot of data, but how do we actually tie, like, we made this change and then the data changed or didn't change? Is that kind of... Well, you can have four recommendations from an audit, yeah. and how do you know which one? So, yeah, so multiple recommendations, multiple strategic initiatives. So, um, I mean, so I just have two answers to that. I mean, you know, I mean, I think one, uh, and again, with the work uh, Ilsa's doing, um, I keep pointing to Ilsa because she's sitting right here, but, 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 but the, work, the work that Ilsa's doing as the director of teaching and learning around the audits, I think we, have, we are pretty thoughtful in terms of trying to understand those trends and um, you know the scientific, like the causal nature of that is in very rarely, right? Are we actually able to prove causality, mm -hmm. right? So, so in general, right? Like we're overall assessing our program, mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to track like over time how our program is doing. Mm -hmm. We identify certain areas and mostly identified ourselves, right? Like we think this is, you know, we're not we're looking at ERB data or we're looking at survey data or we're looking at, um, you know, teachers are working with a group of children and being like, we don't feel like like. This, you know, we're not accomplishing what we're hoping to accomplish, right? So there's a lot of like that type of reflection. And so then we have these processes where we're trying to figure out how do you make, get that better? Um, so I, I, mean, I, would, I don't think we would ever claim that there's like a, a, a strict like scientific process, right? That, that's being utilized year over year. At the same time, we spend so much time thinking about it. And I certainly know, so for example, Reach Beyond, one of the things that Ilsa in particular has been really good about trying to have us do is track and kind of actually capture along the way how students are talking about reaching beyond um, and, and, and how they're reacting to it. And so she's been collecting and others as well, but she's been driving that work around their responses to reach beyond block, their responses to reach beyond week, their, and, and, and making sure that five years from now, again, whether or not we can prove it scientifically, I don't know, but five years from now, we'll be able to look and say, oh, you know, back in 2018, when we asked a group of students to think about reaching beyond, they said, this. In 2023, students are saying this. Our hypothesis is that students are getting better at understanding what it means to reach beyond, mm -hmm. that they are getting, that it gets more specific in terms of the types of things they're able to identify, and that the skill sets that they're developing, which they may or may not be able to speak to, but that the skill sets that they're developing are, are, are we're able to, to measure and track at some level. So I don't I don't know if, if that fully answers your question, but I mean there's a there's a part of the reason we also do the audits. I think the way we do is that we know that um, you know it's hard to track all of these things over time, and at the same time, you know, for example, you have like you know with a math audit, it's not every teacher necessarily, you know, like in, you know who's covering math, and so to some degree, you, know, you do have a subset of teachers who are able to then kind of track that more carefully over time. But other questions. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the um, those of you who are online who are still there, um, uh, who who, uh, who spent time to, to to join us as well virtually. Um, we really appreciate it, and um, I hope you have a fabulous afternoon. Thanks. Okay.